I just heard the PM say that he believes that this war is winnable for Ukraine, as he calls it, for the NATO alliance. And I was wondering if the Prime Minister can outline how he envisions that. What is that then? The situation where Russia is completely expelled from the territory that was formerly Ukrainian, including the region of Crimea. Is the Prime Minister genuinely of the opinion that a scenario that is grounded in realism? Is it really going to happen according to his concept and vision for the future? The answer to all these questions always begins and ends in Kiev. And in the end, there is only one group of people, and that is the Ukrainian government, which can decide when the moment might be that they are willing to engage in talks with Moscow to end this war. Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, has put forward proposals. The peace plan that they presented during the G20 summit held in Bali in the year 2022, along the lines we are now working on, and we assist with the accountability activities within it and various other matters. That is there now. However, in the end, that can only lie with the president of Ukraine and his team. And so, with Ukraine, that can never be our fault. And the moment they would decide, okay, now we feel strong enough to have reached to have conversations, that's up to them. We can never predict when that is from here. We can only ensure that they are in the most favorable position, that we have as little loss of life as possible in Ukraine. And that is our task. All right, so I do have an additional question. Because when the Prime Minister discusses Kiev and the government of Ukraine, it appears that we have a disparity of opinion in that regard. Because I perceive Ukraine as a failed state that is not governed at all by Kyiv, Washington, District of Columbia, since at least 2014. And if the PM indeed does not think so, I also see him shaking his head, then I am very curious how he assesses the leaked phone conversation shortly before the Americans committed the state coup in Maiden Square in Feb 2014. From Victoria Newland, Jeffrey Payette, and one or two other officials regarding the individuals who would assume specific positions in the event of a successful coup on Maiden Square or in Maidan. How does he evaluate such a telephone conversation? Is that a mere coincidence? Are they simply engaging in conversation with each other? Or is there, in fact, a genuinely substantial infiltration by the American State Department in Ukraine? I additionally consider the famous narrative of Biden. Then he served as the vice president under Obama. He arrived at the location and stated that the prosecutor had to be dismissed within a few hours. That was the prosecutor who wanted to investigate the corruption surrounding Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden. Made a substantial amount of money at Burisma, all through highly questionable dealings in which the offspring of American high-ranking politicians profit significantly from Ukraine. How does the Prime Minister assess all these examples, all this evidence that critics provide, which of course all come from the Dutch press, but which are simply factually correct, showing that there is a very large overlap, not to say infiltration, by United States foreign policy in Ukraine, as indicated by the evidence presented by the critics from the Dutch press? How does he evaluate or judge that? Yes, Chairman, if you of course throw a handful of sand into the water, then it all becomes murky. And I can also say a few things. There are, of course, indications that there was also significant corruption in Ukraine. We know that. And the things that Mr. Bode mentions here, I cannot assess all of that exactly, and I will leave that to him for now. However, Ukraine, since the association agreement, and luckily also the Netherlands, has managed to support it. After the 2016 referendum, Ukraine has chosen a path that aims for closer alignment with Europe and has been successful in its efforts. That means corruption has also been fought since then. And now, in the context of EU accession, they have to combat this war, which is a declared priority. We see the progress there. It's incredibly important. We support them to continue with that. Yet the key is that on Feb 23, 2022, Russia, four times larger than Ukraine, four times more powerful, with a four times larger economy, four times as many people, four times as large a military, invaded the country. The victory march was set in Moscow 10 days later, but it hasn't happened yet, and in my view, it will never happen. And that thousands and thousands and thousands of people have died in the meantime, that is not acceptable. That not only touches all of our values, it also has an impact on the safety of the country itself. It also impacts our safety, because in fact, if Ukraine were to be vanquished, that would have a direct impact on our security. And that is also my main argument always towards America. 
One is not only in NATO for historical reasons. One is a member of NATO because this particular region of Europe must not be subject to Russian influence. That has a direct impact on the security interests of the United States. Yes, this is an answer that does not have any relevance or connection to the question I asked in any way, shape or form. So, I will ask him once more in a different manner. The Prime Minister states in reply to my query regarding his perspective on the path to peace or triumph for either party that it is situated with Kyiv. And my query in response to that is, to what extent is it actually realistic? Is it genuinely serious to pretend that there exists such a thing as a sovereign government in Kyiv, the capital city of Ukraine? Now that we have knowledge based on numerous examples, like the leaked phone conversations of Victoria Newland with Jeffrey Piat discussing what should happen after the State Department would have taken over power in Ukraine in February 2014, we can understand the implications more clearly. What is the reaction of the Prime Minister to the fact that Joe Biden, as the Vice President of the United States, is involved in a story that is very clear and well known? He is arriving there. That guy needs to be fired within an hour. That person has to go. America rules Ukraine. That is an obvious fact, isn't it? Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you for joining us. And so, therefore, my question is relevant. And so it is a shadow play. It is a puppet show. It is an illusion to say, oh, that lies with Ukraine. Depends on Ukraine itself. Ukraine itself is in charge of the terms of the negotiation, but Ukraine itself is governed by Washington, D.C. So it's America, in other words, it's NATO itself saying we only help an ally. However, they themselves have control over that ally. It is a shadow play. The prime minister is unable to simply dismiss this point. The stories of annual corruption. Corruption is being changed because Kolomoisky is in prison. The prime minister. Yes, Chairman. This is complete nonsense. It's nonsense. The floor is given to the Prime Minister. This is nonsense. Ukraine would not be governed by America. It's a conspiracy. Mr. Bode spreads it on websites where you express yourself. This is really total nonsense. This country was invaded in March 2014. The Crimea was then occupied. In March 2014, Russians invaded. Crimea occupied. Donbass also taken by Russians after. It happened in March 2014. And I can assure you that from Zul 2014, I myself had a lot to do with it, and also the Govt, because MH17 crashed in the Donbass. And that I did not call Kiev. Can you assist me in ensuring that the train runs? Then I had to call Moscow. As only one person had influence in Donbass and Crimea, and in this case it was necessary, we knew it was Vladimir Putin. That's why I rang him for six days straight, and at last the train started running, and we set up the air bridge from Kharkiv. Those are the facts. Since March 2014, that country has been occupied by Russia, not by America, but by Russia. And on February 23, 2022, they followed that up with a massive war of aggression to take control of the entire country. Those are the facts. In light of the possibility of once again not obtaining a reply to my query, I am taking the risk of not receiving an answer to my question. It is impossible to completely separate the Russian reaction, or at least the Russian action or reaction, from the American or NATO presence in that particular location. The Russian response is intricately linked to the presence of the United States or NATO forces in that area. That is, it is a, not a serious response to my question, to then only discuss about as if out of nowhere indeed, Russia suddenly emerges one day with Putin at the helm. What are we going to do? We are going to invade a country. That's not how it happened. In 2008, NATO did say in Bucharest, Ukraine is joining. That happened, right? It did happen that that phone conversation took place between Victoria Newland and Jeffrey Pyatt. Klitschko is heading to Kiev. Poro is becoming the president. That is what happened. That is a fact. They can't deny that, can they? The Americans have a gigantic presence. Take that CIA base, those 12 bases I mentioned in my speech, that armament. And that, in a much broader context of United States foreign policy since Brzezinski, since the 1970s, endgame Ukraine, this is not something that comes out of nowhere. There is indeed a very heavy military, economic, political interdependence between the American State Department and Ukraine. You cannot deny that. I cannot say anything about it in my questions now, repeatedly and again. I hear corruption. Russia is very bad. Russia is extremely terrible. All of it is true. All points are valid. I acknowledge your point. It is not about that at all. 
What is the Prime Minister's perspective on the American presence in Ukraine, which dates back to before the current war that is ongoing in the country? Chairman, I have said it before. I will leave the conspiracy allegations that are being made here for Mr. Baudet. Whatever Mr. Baudet says is that Ukraine would not have had the right to apply for NATO membership. Every country in the Western Hemisphere has the right to apply for NATO membership. That does not mean that NATO membership will be granted immediately. That's not how it works. After those wishes were expressed, also from Ukraine and other countries, it always took many years. Also with Georgia and with other nations, it takes an extremely long time, if it even occurs at all, because there is always a very precarious balance in Europe between the NATO alliance, the Western countries, and Russia. And Russia is there and is not going away. The importance is not only to ask yourself what it means when countries join NATO, but also what it means for legitimate security interests that a country like Russia also has. When the merger of East and West Germany was discussed in 1990, not only was the question asked how to shape it, but also what does that mean for the long-term security interests of the Soviet Union, which was dissolved in 1991. Still discussing 1990, so Soviet Union, for their relationship with United Germany and the expectation of NATO alliance expansion, in the interest, of course, that will always have to be played and switched at those different levels. But that is not an argument for a country like Russia, with their cultural and humanistic tradition, the country with the best poets in the world, with the best composers, with the best architects, with an enormous literary tradition for such a country, with such a history, to invade another country out of nowhere in 2014. In 2022, to follow up with a full-scale war of aggression, already causing thousands of deaths, that can't be justified because you may be afraid Ukraine might join NATO or the EU someday because they expressed that desire. Totally not okay. It can never justify, right? It impacts our interests value directly. The thing I inquired about, which the Prime Minister did not want to respond to because it was a conspiracy, is actually a conspiracy. What is a conspiracy theory? It is an ambiguous accusation that lacks factual basis, often characterized by vague claims and a lack of supporting evidence. Ukraine not sovereign, completely controlled by America. That's what you just said, right? Sure. The PM disputes that. The PM asserts that Ukraine would indeed be a sovereign nation, and this fact is clear, evident, and undeniable to me. And that is the reason why I am asking him to respond to examples like the leaked phone conversation or like the story that Joe Biden has told multiple times about the extremely large influence that America does seem to have on the policy in Ukraine in order to provide clarity and address any concerns or doubts that may arise. And then the Prime Minister says, that's conspiracy, I'm not going to respond to that, that's just lame, just respond to that. What? In the event that the Prime Minister persists in asserting that Kyiv is the capital of a country that has the ability to make its own decisions, does a sovereign country contemplate? How is it possible that three weeks prior to a state coup taking place in Kyiv in February 2014, there is a telephone conversation between the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of the United States and the American Ambassador in Ukraine, during which they coincidentally discuss all the ministerial positions that subsequently come into existence approximately one to one and a half months after the coup and assume control of all those government positions? How can that be? Don't come to me with that conspiracy. It's a question. How is it possible? Is that some kind of crystal ball? Should we request Victoria Nuland to lay tarot cards for us? Because apparently she can foresee. How is that possible? Explain that once if you believe it has all been organic democratic processes. Thanks. It was your final interruption. This was my fourth occasion. No, I believe there is. I am afraid that she is right. However, Chairman, what Mr. Baudet is doing here is completely misrepresenting what happened, and it is important to address this issue accurately and truthfully. Not complete, not comprehensive, with his interpretation, and thereby evoking an atmosphere as if Ukraine, in his speech earlier, it was already from 2004, now it is only from 2014, but it turns out to be from 2004 indeed. I thought he did indeed say that in his speech is completely in the hands of the CIA and the Department of State of the United States. Chairman, that is not true. This is a sovereign country originating from the old Soviet Union. A country with economic problems and certainly in terms of corruption. That's why the Netherlands has always been critical of Ukraine's EU entry. 
We are impressed by how this country has managed since 2016, but especially after February 23, 2022, to accelerate its efforts to see if it can join the EU in line with its ambitions. That's a sum, a lengthy process. It's succeeded in combating corruption. That's the top priority now internally. Without a doubt, the topmost priority is to emerge victorious in this government. The Prime Minister continues. For a few more questions asked to me, and then please proceed to the colleagues. To begin, there was an inquiry regarding the statement made by the Turkish President Erdogan. Talking Ukraine today, Chairman, not Sharia. I won't review all statements of foreign heads of state here either. No need to delve into that topic. It's beyond the scope of this debate. Then there was the question about the U.S. What if Trump gets elected? I have said something about that before. I am convinced that both Donald Trump himself and also the vast majority of the members of the House and the Senate, so of the Congress in America, realize that being embedded also of the United States and the North Atlantic relationship is crucial, not only to avoid repeating the mistake of the United States after the First World War, namely withdrawing from those alliances, but also because ultimately one realizes that an influence here in this part of the world from Russia would be a direct security risk, even a security problem, a major security problem for the United States. And I am convinced that if Barn is re-elected, or if Trump were to be re-elected, in his case after a four-year break, we will succeed in ensuring that the transatlantic relationship remains intact. That's also very important. Then I mentioned in a radio broadcast with Ron Fries in October last year that I would be interested, and that was true, in that job at NATO. I can assure you that in this job as Prime Minister, I will always stand up for Dutch interests and never anything else, and therefore any potential future ambition cannot override that. Then there was the question about Orban. It is true that we are not dealing with the easiest person in the European degree or in NATO, at the same time if you look at the recent events in which he put his foot down. For example, that was at the end of last year to see if we could start with the EU accession. It was on February 1st of this year to reach an agreement on the 50 billion. Did it work? And we'll also need to keep working with Hungary too to ensure that on those files where unanimity is needed, we achieve it. And you know about me, also towards Viktor Orban. If necessary, I won't keep my mouth shut and I will tell what we think about it and why we think that.